so that we could listen to some music while we wait because there will be no more music in the talk itself. So, uh, so thank you for uh, being here and thanks to Amrit and the Sikh Society for inviting me. Um, I'm Radha Kapuria and I am a Libra Hume Early Career Fellow at the University of Sheffield and this talk is based on my PhD research uh, which was completed uh, four years ago now, in 2018, at King's College in London. Um, and I think without further ado, I will launch into this. And uh, I'll start by talking about my location in the present and what interested me in pre-partition Punjab. Um, and it came from a very personal sense of my own social origins in a Punjabi family uh, in India uh, and with this memory of growing up with uh, listening to Punjabi songs at weddings and discovering that these were songs sung by, often the tapes were uh, sung by Pakistani women and to realize that there was this sense of cross-border connection through music which we kind of organically grew up with but we never kind of explored why or try to understand what was happening in pre-partition Punjab. So in a sense, there was almost a nostalgia for this past, for this pre-partition Punjab. And you know, this is what kind of motivated me to start looking at histories of music. Um, and I think it's good to reflect on nostalgia itself and not think of it as simply something that's about romanticizing or it's, you know, that it's uh, unscholarly or it's you know or to think it's very uncritical and uh, the Russian American scholar Svetlana Boyne has talked about uh, nostalgia critically she says it comes from two Greek root words the first is nostos which is to return home and the second is algos which is or algos which is longing so a longing to return home but she defines it both as a longing for a home that no longer exists or it has never existed uh, or a longing for a different place and also a yearning for a different time. So it's two things, yearning for a different place and for a different time. And she says it's most often a rebellion against the modern idea of time, the time of history and progress. So nostalgia often has this sort of almost anti-modern thrust. Uh, however, she says we should, we should be cautious about uh, uh, looking at and adopting a very simple notion of nostalgia, a very simple nostalgia that is not concerned with the future. And this is the important key here for us in South Asia, I mean, those of us who are South Asians who are thinking about South Asia today and what is the future, uh, because as Boyne says, fantasies of the past determine, det determined by needs of the present have a direct impact on realities of the future. So in other words, what do we take from the past is what kind of nostalgia we manufacture is also something we can be conscious about and critical about and do that critically. And so with these sort of brief musings on nostalgia, I'd like to turn to Pul Kanjari or Tawai Pul or Pul Mora, which is basically translates as the bridge of the courtesan. Um, and this is located near the Vaga border. Um, which is the border between India and Pakistan near Amritsar. Uh, so it's midway between Amritsar and Lahore. And this is an abandoned precinct. It's no longer abandoned since the last 15 years there's been a kind of clearing. But it's not something that many people know about or many people visit when they go to the Vaga border. It's just the border and nobody talks about this very important monument. 
and it at one point included a dharamshala or a resting uh, house, a well, a tank, a garden, and a sarai. And it was built on the insistence of uh, Maharaja Ranjit Singh's courtesan wife. Uh, she was Muslim and she was considered to be his favorite wife. Her name was Mora Sarka, Bibi Mora, because she danced like a moor or a peacock. Um, and the story goes that before they were married, she used to come from her village near this spot and perform for the Maharaja somewhere near her, near here. And it's said that the Maharaja was in popular folklore and legend. It was said that he used to listen to watch her sing and dance before he would even go to the Golden Temple to pay his respect. So it led to a lot of uh, sort of discord and opposition amongst the uh, Orthodox Sikhs, as you can imagine. But uh, the reason this uh, structure was built was because one day while she was traveling to meet him and perform for him, her sort of silver slipper fell in the canal in the waters that go from uh, you know, Pathan Court to Lahore, to the Shalimar Gardens in Lahore. And she was very upset and said, I refuse to perform for you unless you build the bridge. So that's how this bridge was built. And in, in keeping with the cosmopolitan nature of Ranjit Singh's court, this spot came to include a mosque, given Bibi Mora was Muslim, a Gurdwara, and a Shiv temple. So that's a Hindu temple that you see in the image there. So, more interestingly, this is a structure located on the border of two states that are at war. It was briefly conquered in skirmishes by both India and Pakistan. Pakistan captured it in 1965. It was reclaimed by India in 1971. And today a war memorial stands on what was essentially a memorial for love. So if considering the future can make us take responsibility for our nostalgic tales, as Svetlana Boyum urges us to do, then we must take a newer look at the past and excavate precious stories from it uh, and about the divergent people uh, you know, who figured in the past. So the story of Bibi Mora is one of these stories. And apart from the cosmopolitanism, what I want to stress on is the remarkable cultural ethnorescence which uh, parts of Punjab witnessed under Maharaja Ranjit Singh's rule. Um, so this is Maharaja Ranjit Singh. Uh, the image on the left is of him as a younger man, so his beard is a bit darker. And the one on the right is him as this is a more sort of stereotypical, well-known image of him as an older man, sort of more secure in his, um, in his power, in his reign. Uh, and you can see that he's sitting into, on two different kinds of uh, sort of seating arrangements. The first is the throne, which is at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. For those of you who visited the museum, you recognize it from there. And the second is a chair. And he was, that is, not, and the reason I'm pointing out the chair is to point out the essentially the modernity of Ranjit Singh, because he was living in this time of, he was sort of, he came to power in. Uh, he seized Lahore in 1799, came to power, sort of was crowned king in 1801, and reigned in 1839. As we know, he was one of the last few uh, South Asian Indian rulers to stand up to British rule. So this just shows you that he was very fond of also sitting on chairs, and uh, he would sit cross-legged even in the chairs. Uh, so I just thought I would mention that because it would have a bearing uh, for our discussion later on of his connection to Europeans and especially to British rivals who came to his court. Uh, that's just a map of Punjab and the Sikh rule. Um, it's the kind of, it shows you the five rivers and Ranjit Singh's uh, Punjab extended by the end of his rule. He had colonized uh, Kashmir, he had colonized Peshawar. So there, it's a fairly huge part of uh, present day Punjab and beyond. Um, and it's mostly it's mostly kind of what is today West Punjab in Pakistan. Uh, this is Ranjit Singh's Punjab with the borders of uh, India and Pakistan today. Um, now, why is it important for us to uh, look at histories of music from Ranjit Singh's period? I think it's important because. When we think of Punjabi classical music, we think of the Patiala Gharana, and we think of just one or two stereotypical 
sort of names, but we don't recognize what the last sovereign ruler of United Undivided Punjab did for music. And we do find that actually um, there was many of the lineages that ended up culminating, you know, culminated in the Patiara Dharana began at Lahore. So this is the kind of the important courtly center before uh, before annexa British annexation in 1849 and uh, the, the revolt of 1857 as well, when many musicians had to flee Delhi and other sort of centers and go to smaller towns like Patiala, which is when the Tharanas there uh, kind of became prominent. Um, now, to, also to understand from a political point of view, why it is important to look at uh, musicians, the aspects like painting, textiles, jewelry, other parts of culture have been looked at for indeed thing, but musicians and dancers are seen as frivolous, they're not important, they're not part of political history so to speak. So I essentially want to do three things in this talk today. First is to demonstrate the thriving environment for the classical arts, especially music and dance at Ranjit Singh's court. Second, establish how he was partial to this class of musicians and dancers. Uh, you know, he was, he had kind of a partiality towards them and he even married two courtesans in the face of uh, stiff religious orthodoxy. And finally, I focus on a specialized troupe of Ranjit's uh, performers. These were the cores of Amazonian female dancers who cross-dressed and dressed up as men. Uh, and they were particularly uh, the signature of male European eyes. Uh, and they were very important in representing the Sikh stage to outsiders. Um, and speaking of connect, uh, representing to outsiders, this is an image of a Sikh musician. That's what the catalogue at the Lahore Museum says, but I'm not sure that is a Sikh musician. It may actually be a Muslim musician. And there is a trumpet, you know, sitting next to his trumpet. So there was this connection with Western band music as well. So this is perhaps one of the only surviving images of a musician from Ranjit Singh's time that I could find. And uh, based on his headgear, it, it's possible he was Muslim. Um, and because I, I, I doubt that looks like Sikh headgear, but again, this is something that can be debated because we don't know what the headgear exactly might have been. Um, and there's a halo around him which suggests he may be a spiritual figure of some kind as well. Um, but yeah, his dress suggests that, you know, he was in the kind of, he was some kind of military band or something, quite, quite important and quite royal. Um, this is Behram Khan, who was employed by Ranjit Singh. And uh, it was his descendants who then came on to become the Patiala Dharana, his musical descendants. Uh, so he, after Ranjit Singh's death, Behram Khan, who was a Drupad singer, he moved to the court of Jaipur. And one of his students, Goki Bai, who was a female vocalist, she trained uh, 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 Fateh Ali and Ali Baksh or Alia Fatu of the Patiala Karana. And again, you know, Ustad Bade Kulam Ali Khan of the Patiala Karana, whom we all know of today, his great grandfather was also uh, employed at Ranjit Singh's court. So his name was Ishad Ali Khan. So in short, Lahore was a very key point of origin for most, for the most important Punjab Karana, which is the Patiala Karana. Um, but I think because of the dissolution of the Sikh state, because of you know, this British period in Lahore, we forget this princely era of Lahore, and that, and that has implications for our memories of music as well. Now, music was a very important part of being elite, learned, cultured in 19th century Punjab. Um, there is a treatise uh, in Braj Bhasha called Buddhi Prakash Darpan, which was written in 1681, but the only kind of written version that we find that exists dates again from Ranjit Singh's reign. And it was written in Lahore. And it praises, uh, it's about rags and ragging, it's a musical treatise, but it's actually praising uh, the abundance of the city of Lahore. And he says, Panchab ki sobh hai seheru naam Lahora, nar nari jame sada dipat de sirmora. So 
the glory of the land of five rivers is the city named Lahore. Men and women shine this crest jewel of the country. And he goes on to talk about its sort of ecological abundance as well. Um, and he also says that uh, the name of Lahore is such that no other place appears so. It is the gem of the country, the brilliance of the world. Nam Lahore na or lage mani desen ki mahi ki madhi so hai. So again, it's praising this uh, this sort of uh, city. So it's a sense. So this is one of the few musical treatises from Punjab, which you know, which is from the 18th, from the 17th and 18th centuries, and survives up to the 19th. Um, now, apart from addressing the lacuna of you know, musicians have not been studied. Why is it important to study this as historians of Punjab, which is what I am? Uh, ethnomusicological work on Punjabi music has studied the notion of affect or the experience of emotional energy as stimulated by the performative traditions of music and dance, uh, and how affect resonates in a wider social and political context. Uh, recently, there have been interventions on the history of emotions in South Asia, which also support the argument for the centrality of affect in shaping the materiality and practices of political diplomacy. And which is why, as I would like to argue, it, music and dance shape the strategic relationship of Ranjit Singh with the British, who were his main political rivals. Uh, so this is a very important perspective on how cultural expression aids meaning making in society and it helps us uh, have a more grounded historical understanding of politics and culture. Uh, and so connected with that is Ranjit Singh's harem. Uh, he had a fairly large harem of at least 20 wives, uh, most prominent of them being Mehtab Kaur of the Kanheya clan or Kanheya Missile and Raj Kaur from the Nakai Misal. Uh, but these were the political wives, women he married to secure his sort of hold over all the Sikh missiles and Sikh factions. But the women he married solely for sort of affective reasons for because he fell in love with them were two famous Muslim courtesans from Amritsar. And uh, as I shared the story of Bibi Mora, he would he was so fond of her that the Jathedar of the Akal Takht at the Golden Temple, Akali Pulla Singh, was quite angry with him for meeting Bibi Mora before coming to the Golden Temple. Uh, and apparently, you know, he insisted on marrying Mora despite being threatened with the award of uh, 100 lashes uh, by the Akal Takht. Uh, so he went forth to receive these 100 lashes, but apparently they took pity on him and just gave him one symbolic lash and let him go. Um, he struck coins or medals which bore uh, her name in 1811 because they were inscribed with a peacock, so they were called the Mora Shahi Sikka. Um, and this again uh, angered everybody because none of his other wives were given this uh, stature. Um, now, this is the story of how you know dancing girls and musicians are so important for Ranjit Singh, but. The discourse we get in the accounts of European travelers to Lahore uh, under Ranjit Singh are of a totally different way. So you can imagine what they would be like, right? What is the view? Of, what is the European view of dancing girls? It's they are the symbol of debauched India. If Ranjit Singh is associated with dancing girls, it, it emasculates him. It shows him as politically incompetent, as someone who is not worthy of ruling Punjab, right? So this is the kind of uh, perspective you find in European travelogues. But the only text in the Sikh tradition which talks about how a Sikh ruler should behave is the Prem Sumar, which is pre-Ranjit Singh. Now, the date for the Prem Sumar is under debates, but most likely people think it's late, uh, eight, uh, late 18th, early 19th century. But it's pre-Ranjit Singh for sure, according to many scholars. And so the Prem Sumar says that courtesans are very important for any ruler because they will expose to temptation any holy man, any yogi, digambar, sannyasi, bairagi, peer, udasi, by proffering wealth, tasty food, perfume, and fine clothing, or music and dance. And he who succumbs should be told, bogus ascetic, why did you ever leave your home? You're still in bondage to your base instincts. 
Your appetite for food shows how threadbare your renunciation is. Resume the life of a householder and find yourself a job. So clearly this is a very old thing in Punjabi history. It's not recent. All of us who hear our parents telling us to be useful and find a job. But so that is the kind of role for courtesans I envisaged in the sort of Sikh tradition as well. But as opposed to this, in European writing, the dancing girl is a sign of complete ruin and of it, she's a sexualized symbol, she's a sign of um, uh, you know temptation, and this is the Sikhs taking over Lahore. Uh, it was painted by Alexander Soltikov, who was a, I think a Russian prince, and then this is a lithograph uh, made by Lider based on that painting. And you can see the courtesans on the sort of terraces of the buildings in Lahore, and they sat sort of, uh, you know, viewing the entry of these martial Sikhs to, who were taking over the city. So it's very, this is very interesting uh, imagery, which also showed up in their writing, in the writing of Europeans. <clears throat> this is another image created by an unknown English lady, a uh, street scene in Lahore, and I think you can see there is this, again, a feminine figure, oops, sitting up there in one of the balconies. Um, so, which is to also say that uh, courtesans were a very important part of the sort of life of Lahore and life of cities, Amritsar and Lahore in Punjab. Um, this is again an image of notch girls with cups of wine uh, from the account of Osborne, who was an aide to William Bentinck, who was the governor general of the East India Company and who had a lot of dealings with Ranjit Singh. Um, again, one more image in the British Library uh, from very much within Ranjit Singh's reign by Godfrey Neller and uh, you know, beauty of the court of Ranjit Singh, love at first sight, but again she's been drawn in a very exaggerated, sexualized manner. But I think we should also remember that this is not simply orientalizing or othering, which is a first, which is what is the main note of all this writing and European engagement with uh, the horde, with the you know, musicians and dancers. But there's also a sense of complete bewilderment at Indian music, because these Europeans have never heard uh, Indian music. They don't know uh, the sort of uh, rules and the sort of modes and how it works. So there's also a sense of unfamiliarity, which, will, which breeds content. So, um, uh, this is again from Osborne, who, uh, from whose uh, book we saw this image. Um, and he says, uh, the Maharaja sent for us a new set of dancing girls, though they turned out to be 12 of the ugliest old women I ever saw, who were highly indignant at being sent away on account of their looks without being permitted to display their talents in screaming. Now, screaming is a nice, very nice way of uh, you know, it captures, it sounds, it sounds comical, but actually this is how many Europeans thought Indian music was perceived as screaming by them. They couldn't understand what the sort of, uh, you know, classical uh, techniques of Indian music are. So it sounded like screaming to them. Um, but this, I've just used this one slide to capture a range of negative, uh, censorious writing on Indian music at Ranjit Singh's court but because of time, I won't go into all of them. But this is a kind of representative, representative quote. One of the few Europeans who gave an objective account which wasn't biased uh, was the Aust Austrian diplomat, Baron Hugel. And uh, his account is quite detailed, and which is why, I mean, as a historian, I can say that there is a, because of that greater detail and there's less, less, like a lesser amount of prejudice, you can actually get a better idea of the dancing girls at Ranjit Singh's court in Hubel's account. And uh, he notes very importantly that at Lahore, the lavish profusion which comes with the residence of a court causes their art to be more valued and better paid for. And he makes the comparison with Calcutta, where, which is in East India and Bengal, and he says that they are not, as sometimes happens in Calcutta, slaves or stolen children, but they are relatives and daughters of dancers, and their education begins at five years old and followed by an apprenticeship in song and dance. So there's this recognition.
recognition of the professionalism at Lahore for being a sort of a dancing woman and a performing female performing artist. And in the records, the Persian records at Ranjit Singh's court itself, the Umdatu Tawari, uh, which I think one of the, this is from the ones that have been translated into English because I can't read Persian. But some of the original Persian documents are still there at the Royal Asiatic Society. So if anyone is interested in translating that or looking at that, that's uh, very exciting. You can do that. But in the Umdatu Tawari, there's a very different view of courtesans. And these musicians and these courtesans keep showing up in, the, in these official court chronicles of Ranjit Singh. And this is a very typical statement again. Again, I've used just one quote to give you a sense of a, a very large volume of such writing on the courtesans. And it says, uh, and the clever singers uh, made it clear in their most pleasant mood that they could make the audience like pictures on the wall. So it's basically the effect of music of making them dumbfounded. So you are so touched and so moved by the music that you are you, you almost become like a painting and you almost are sort of you freeze in time and uh, by you know by, by making them listen to one slowly developing charming tune of theirs they could lay open the doors of happiness success pleasure so again the impact of music and again the sort of impact of music that it sort of erased tiresomeness, rust of worry and anxiety uh, from the hearts of the world. So this is a kind of phrase that shows up after every political negotiation that Ranjit Singh has. There is this sort of performance, this spectacle which he puts up for his, um, for his European uh, visitors, for his political rivals, and even for people like Victor Jacquemont, who was a French scientist whose research Ranjit Singh funded. Um, uh, there's another aspect of this, which is uh, there's an emphasis on planetary bodies as well, where uh, you know Jupiter and Venus rejoice. So there's this kind of writing where the impact of music is not just on the Earth and on the world of humans, but on uh, the you know as the world of astrology, and this is interesting because Ranjit Singh had a deep and obsessive interest in medicine across Indic, Islamic, and Western traditions. So this understanding of the supernatural power of music and the performing arts may explain why after every political negotiation, there were references to music of these uh, you know dance of these beautiful. Uh, you know, moon-faced singers or the music of the Milasis or the Bards. Um, and I would like to argue that uh, it wasn't just that these dancers and singers were important to Ranjit Singh. I would say that with the passage of time and with the consolidation of the Sikh state as a powerful entity, uh, these singers and dancers actually became an indispensable part of state entertainment. And I mentioned Victor Jacquemont, the French naturalist, earlier. Uh, and it's in response to Jacquemont's visit to Lahore that Ranjit Singh comes up with this experimental idea of what the Europeans call the Amazons, which is the female dancers who cross-dressed as men and put up this performance for mainly for the European visitors. But uh, then it became a, a feature at Ranjit Singh's court. Uh, now, this is in 1831, and which is eight years before Ranjit Singh's death. So it's towards the end of his rule that he comes up with this group of women. And he says, a royal order was issued to all the dancing girls of Lahore to put on male garments, hold swords and bows in their hands, and be decorated with other arms as well, and then to present themselves on elephants and horses in perfect smartness and with great grace. Um, and uh, the Amazons were noted by others, others who visited, uh, like uh, Sir Alexander Burns, uh, who was part of the great game with Afghanistan. So he was also called Bokhara Burns. Uh, he was a Scottish traveler and explorer. But we'll come to him in a minute. Uh, in the Persian chronicles themselves, uh, the Maharaja would often refer to these uh, 
to the Zanana Khatun or the women's contingent and say this is the Subedar, Jamadar and Chokdar, which are terms in the military which he gave to these musicians and uh, to these uh, dancing girls. And uh, Benthink even sort of granted them with a gift of rupees 1000, uh, which you can imagine was a huge amount in those times. Now, these women were not actually trained uh, in military combat, but this was a kind of, uh, you know, again, affect. It's, he's referring to these women through these terms. It's almost ironical, it's comical almost, but uh, it's, it's only half comical, they are very important still. So he will display them to the Governor General uh, of the East India Company and to other European powers. Now, according to Alexander Burns, Bukhara Burns, uh, he described the Ranjit, uh, Ranjit Singh's Amazons in the following terms. This is a print of an Amazon. Now, the term Amazon comes from Greek myth. These were Greek warrior women. Uh, in ancient Greece. So that's the kind of popular imagination of the Amazon uh, in, in the European mind. Now, according to Alexander Burns, uh, you know, on our arrival, we found him seated on a chair, found Ranjit seated on a chair with a party of 30 to 40 dancing girls who were all dressed in boys' clothes, mostly natives of Kashmir or the adjacent mountains, on whom grace and beauty had not been sparingly bestowed. And uh, he describes their costume and said they had a small bow and quiver in each hand. And he says, again, through humor, he, Ranjit refers to them and says, this is one of my regiments, but they tell me it is one I cannot discipline. A remark which amused us and mightily pleased the women themselves. Right. Um, so I think the, this was a very interesting and intriguing group of women. And nowhere else do we find an Indian ruler coming up devising a sort of cross-dressing troop of female dancers in a similar way. We may have examples of there actually being female warriors in some contexts, like in 17th, uh, 16th century Malwa, there was actually some female warriors. Uh, in this case, they weren't warriors in real life, but they did mimic combat, and they did these sort of mock dance rituals, which were uh, you know, aimed to uh, mimic the victory of Ranjit Singh on the battlefield. So there's a sense of spectacle which is very important in political diplomacy that shows up. Now, uh, people who are into music and dance would like to know what is the dance these women did, cross-dressing dance. And one thing I must say, the reason they're so heavy on text and such few images is because there are no images which have Ranjit Singh displayed alongside a dancing girl. Uh, there's almost no images of Ranjit Singh with women, apart from that Kalighat painting we saw earlier, which was with his wives, but that wasn't produced in Punjab, as we know. It's from uh, East India. Uh, it's only later on in the reign, in the sort of reign of his successors, that we see more images of dancing girls from the Punjab courts, which is itself is interesting because if they're so important, why is he not painting, getting them painted? But that could, again, that's a sort of, you could, you could debate and you could argue that it's because he already faced so much orthodoxy from uh, the Akaltaks and the Akali Nihans for kind of uh, marrying these Muslim courtesans that he kind of perhaps toned it down in painting. But what was the dance that these women did? So this is an image of the Keherwa dance from uh, 18th century Lucknow. And here you can see uh, these women have you know, kind of tucked up their skirts to sort of look like men and wore, put turbans on their heads. And it was a kind of uh, a very uh, martial kind of dance. So this is one of the sort of theories they could perhaps be doing a version of the Keherwa dance, uh, where they appeared as men. So the dance required you to look like a man. This is one image. Uh, here is another image of the Keherwa dance at the court of the Maratha ruler uh, from the early 19th century. Again, this woman is dressed like a man. The other example, the other explanation could be that it was a backhanded compliment to his mother-in-law, Rani Sadakor, who was a very uh, feisty and powerful warrior herself. And uh, she was the leader of the Kanhaiya mission. So remember, his, her daughter married Ranjit Singh. And she was a very important figure in Ranjit Singh's takeover of Lahore. So without her support, he could not have become uh, king of Punjab. 
and ruler of Lahore. And she commanded a large number of cavalry men, some 8,000 men of horses. And, uh, you know, so the relationship with Sada Kaur was a fraught one. He admired her at the beginning of his career, but uh, it was more estranged later on in life. So perhaps we could see that Ranjit's emphasis on female performers' clothes to dress as cavalrymen on horseback could be a backhanded compliment to Sada Kaur, uh, or a sense of uh, signaling to her his victory or you know, authority over her, we don't know. Then the other, perhaps more plausible explanation is that they could be doing a version of the Gatka dance, which is, uh, you know, it, it's something that's present even today. This is an image of uh, Akali Nihang men performing it. Um, and uh, so perhaps this was his way of uh, standing up to the opposition he faced from Akali Kula Singh uh, and, you know, that by commissioning such female cross-dressing dancers, he was also proclaiming his autonomy from this orthodox section of the Sikhs. But it's all conjecture. Culturally, from the Punjab hills, which is where uh, Punjab hills is the term that sort of colonial British rulers to, uh, gave to the region of Himachal Pradesh. But we know that most of these dancers were from Kashmir and from the hills. And this is an image of a turban woman from a village in Chamba. Uh, so clearly in parts of the hills, there are uh, places where women wear turbans. So this could just simply also just, this could be the inspiration as well. It could have come from the dancers, the suggestion. Um, the, only, the only supposed visual image of the Amazon that I have found is from the Lahore Museum. This is a Raja watching a dancing girl. Now she has a sword and she is dancing. So this could, is most likely the closest image of a dancing girl with a sword, which is something which uh, you know, symbolizes militant uh, uh, weapons and dancing with them. And there's a musician accompanying her on the tabla. But an art historian I spoke who said, why is the uh, string instrument, the tanpura, lying flat on the ground? It could probably be that the sword belongs to the uh, visitor who's the, you know, the Raja watching her perform and she has kind of taken it from him, middle of the dance and thrown her uh, tampura on the side and picked up his sword. So again, it's, there's no clear 100% uh, foolproof visual depiction of the Amazon. This could possibly, it could possibly not. This again is possibly an Amazon because it's from the Punjab plain. It's something that was painted in either Lahore or Amritsar around 1850. It's at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. Uh, but again, this is simply a woman with a turban and a bow. Uh, there's no evidence that she's a dancing girl. That there's nothing to do with music or dance here. So that kind of is uh, the summary of the material, visual material on the Amazons. And I will uh, just move on to describing how well off the musicians and dancers were economically and financially. And according to Hugel, Barry Hugel, who we just heard from, uh, the female performers from the Sikh kingdom were always carried about in gharis, which were covered vehicles drawn by oxen, as you can see in the image here. Uh, and they were usually escorted by armed police who were paid for fear of them being robbed of costly jewels. So these uh, armed police were either paid by the dancing girls themselves or by the Sikh ruler on, for them. Uh, and again, there's evidence of how on when he was on his deathbed and he battled illness, Ranjit was frequently entertained by music from the Rababis who were presented with a gift of 200 rupees and two pairs of gold bangles each. So th this again, is, and you know, there was one, um, one of his uh, courtesans, one of his favorite courtesans was called Bashina Billo because she had eyes like a cat. Uh, and she had a jagir or a land grant of 8,000 rupees a year, uh, which is huge. And, uh, you know, Alexander Burns, who writes about it, he notes that this was double the amount given to other girls. Even so, 4,000 rupees a year is a very huge land grant. And that just shows you how well off they were financially. And 
Now, in contrast to the wealth of archival and textual information on these dancing girls and musicians for Ranjit Singh, for his successors, we have not as much written evidence, but again, we have a lot of visual evidence. This is an image of Maharaja Sher Singh, whom you can see in the far left, watching a dance performance at Lahore. Um, this has been painted by Vishen Singh, and there's, an, there's a better image of uh, the Lahore Darbar and Sher Singh again sitting in the middle here, uh, listening to, watching this beautiful dance performance uh, at the Lahore Darbar. And Sher Singh was uh, his was the second person to succeed, or the third. It was a, it was a very fraught period after Ranjit Singh died. There was a lot of infighting. A lot of his sons and grandsons kept dying, and there was a so Sher Singh was the only sort of successor who ruled for some time and he made sure there were lots of paintings of him so people would remember him. But he wasn't strong in the same way as uh, his father was, in nowhere close to. Uh, but again, if you notice here, there's uh, three women dancing, but there's a small cluster, actually quite a, a sizable amount of women who are actually sitting here and singing. And there is an old woman here as well. Uh, who's dressed entirely in white, and if you, you know, look closely, her face is shown, there's age shown, there's wrinkles on her face, just to show how when courtesans would become older, they would be only singing and no longer dancing, whereas the rest of them are still dressed in colorful clothes, and you never know, they may join the three in the center for another performance or for the rest of the performance. And uh, the instrumentalists here are all men which is also very interesting. And we can discuss that in the Q&A if you like. Uh, but again, it's a very rich image. And sorry, I, I had a close-up. But here you can see the older woman. Um, and uh, it's very interesting. There's a lot of attention to detail of the, each of the instruments. And uh, some of the men are also singing you know, and accompanying the women who are leading the main chorus. Um, yeah. And uh, these are the images from the Punjab plains from the Lahore court. There is equally a huge number of images from the Punjab hills, from Pahari painting, Kangra, uh, Chamba, and all these parts where the hill rajas also patronize dancing girls. But uh, according to B.N. Goswami, there's not much written about that in the hills. There is, uh, there's a lot of visual evidence. But in Lahore, there's the opposite. You have a lot of written stuff, but not enough. Uh, visual uh, archives. These are Maharaja Ranjit Singh's two grandsons. And these are, again, uh, the only sort of solo images of a Sikh ruler or a Sikh prince with a musician or with a uh, performing artist. So the one on top is Naunihal Singh, uh, who was seen, was depicted here enjoying a notch. And they're sort of musicians as well. And the one on the bottom is Sher Singh's uh, son, Pratap Singh, and uh, there's a musician in the background if you look carefully. Um, and we're almost close to uh, concluding, and I want to sort of refer to refer back to Pul Kanjri that we started with, that monument. Just one moment. And Pul Kanjari, I just want to refer to it again to emphasize how important it was as, uh, as a monument, as a sort of physical marker of Ranjit Singh's territory. Uh, because even some, almost a decade, almost a century after he, uh, you know, after he ruled, there was a ballad which was collected by a British colonial ethnographer, uh, uh, you know, Rose, in his glossary of the tribes and castes of the Punjab. Uh, he collected this ballad, which was still popular, called the Ballad of Hari Singh Nalva, who was one of Ranjit Singh's, I'm sorry, he may not be Ranjit Singh, but he was, yeah, he was one of Ranjit Singh's generals. And in this ballad, they quote him as saying, the phrase goes, Teja Singh di Fojo da Sikho Menu Nehi Akbar, Pehla Dera Ravi De Kande, Duja Ravi De Par, Tija Dera Pul Kanjri De, Chautha Vazira Baal, Chambe ghode nu devi thapiyan, tu rakh dhwaliyan di laj. 
So he says, O Sikhs, I trust not Teja Singh's army. My first camp will be on the hither side of the Ravi's bank, and my second beyond it. My third halt will be at Pulkanji and the fourth at Wazirabad. Patting his bay steed, Ranjit Singh said, Save my honor for the sake of my gray hairs. Now, you can see that Pulkanji is a really important part of the geography of Ranjit Singh's Punjab. And um, I will end with an image of an elephant made up with dancing girls and musicians. Uh, I think it's a really important image because the elephant was very important to Ranjit Singh. And, uh, you know, he, uh, there are anecdotes of Ranjit Singh as a child accompanying his father Mahan Singh into battle astride on an elephant as a child. And later on, when he was Maharaja, he regularly used uh, the elephants as prestigious gifts. And very importantly, at the famous Ropar Darbar of 1831, which is when uh, the dancing girls also played an important role in negotiations with William Benting, uh, he also, at that same Darbar, he remounted the British officers on his own elephants. He said, your elephants are not good enough. And he said, the equipage of the British elephants were, superior, were inferior and said, you need to get on to my sort of better elephants. So this was again a subtle yet very unmistakable show of strength on Rajin Singh's part. So a composite elephant made up of female performers who are most likely courtesans, uh, also signifies auspiciousness because as we know the the elephant is a symbol of uh, the elephant headed Lord Ganesh, a, pro a propitious deity in the Hindu pantheon who is considered to bring prosperity, peace and success. And courtesans were considered auspicious and felicitous uh, in pre-colonial Punjab. So you start any uh, political negotiation, you start any major thing with the, these women singing or dancing. So very much in contrast to uh, the sort of negative image that dancing girls have in the present, they were part of the sort of auspicious world uh, and they were seen as being uh, felicitous. You know, they were important and, uh, uh, you know, you started anything with the dancing girls. Um, so in conclusion, uh, these Amazonian cores of female huntress performers make sense from their location within princely culture and the paternalism in Ranjit Singh's martial and masculine state. These women embody through their masculine style acrobatics, uh, through dance and music, an open celebration of the martial glory of the Sikh state. Um, and also, uh, you know, how given their centrality, uh, as women, uh, uh, they were also celebrate. They celebrated the Sikh state's exploits on the battlefield, but they also subverted gender hierarchies through the clearing of their you know, dressing and of, of their sort of cross-dressing sartorial appearance. But this is in the context of explicit military discipline. So uh, Ranjit Singh's court was one of explicit military discipline, and in this context where it's so hard to stand up to the Maharaja. The dancing girls were the only group who were most well suited to subvert the lines of deference uh, which uh, everyone had to maintain towards the all-powerful Ranji. For example, there was the celebration of the Holy Festival and the dancing girls are the only ones who can go and throw color on the Maharaja. Whereas with everybody else, you can't, you can't uh, bridge that sort of physical distance with the ruler. So they were the only ones who emerged as capable of publicly subverting hierarchies of state power. And uh, so we need to remember that Ranjit's regime was known as much for its reliance on politically astute diplomacy as much as active warfare. And this helps us to situate these dancers uh, in a very important position where they broadcast not only the military superiority of the new Sikh state to, to its opponents, but also the cultural superiority. Uh, so, in short, uh, this experiment uh, epitomizes a very singular kind of martiality as well, which was very different from the aggressive masculinist martiality of the Akali Nihams. So, in the construction of this troupe, he was curiously inclusive and Catholic, showcased a version of Sikh masculinity which was yoked to a more cosmopolitan variety of statecraft as opposed to the 
conventional location of Sikh masculinity within a very solely aggressive and militant religious setting. So I think hope, I hope this evidence helps us reframe the debate on female performers in North India in 19th century in general and to look at them as important tools of state negotiation in Indo-European diplomacy. Thank you. So please feel free to write to me or drop any queries or feedback, questions on my email IDs which are up on the screen. Um, we touched on it a little bit with like the Agal and like their relationship with Jeet Singh. But like little aspects like Ajit Singh promoting drinking wine and like tobacco and stuff like that. How is that relationship in just outside of this episode with his wife and the dancers, mm. like generally throughout his, his reign? What was that relationship like? Um, so I think even uh, the little I have read on his episode with wine again, I don't know how much you can uh, A, believe because much of it comes again from the European writers. And uh, the other evidence you find is that he was he would drink while he was doing his political negotiations and so it was part of his uh, sort of work ethic almost this is the little i know so it, i think this the sense of how we view it today and this is particularly european way where they you know there were these uh, typical painting of ranjit singh having bacchanalian scenes and drinking liquid fire. I think he definitely did drink and he was sort of fond of his whatever uh, kind of Indian they see his forms of alcohol which the British couldn't deal with sometimes. They said, oh, it's liquid fire and things like that. But uh, again, there's, there's accounts of him doing uh, drinking and doing these meetings. So it wasn't always, you know, either or. And let's face it, he was one of the strongest opponents and rivals to the European and to the East India Company. They didn't manage to take over uh, Punjab while he was alive. And it took almost 10 years even after he died. So there was some kind of strength there. And I think when you find a rival that's strong, you find ways to, uh, you know, uh, basically vilify them and find ways to demonize them. So it's typical uh, Oriental monarch and Oriental despot view which we find in these records yeah but I, I haven't read anything about how wine and tobacco figured in the connection to the account right. um, uh, you talk about how the courtesans are very important as tools of statecraft uh, but is there also evidence in the archive of how courtesans exercise their own agency with regard to the court um, unfortunately, I haven't found any evidence of, um, <coughs> you know, a petition from a courtesan or something like that. But, uh, in you know, as opposed to that, there's a lot of reference to them by name and of Ranjit Singh attending, for example, the wedding of one of the courtesan's sons at the Wazir Khan Mosque in Lahore. So, I'm going out of his way. So, so I think whatever material I have seen shows you how they were a really important part of his, uh, you know, of his, just his daily sort of annual or monthly life. And like, there's evidence of him making sure they give very lavish gifts on uh, sort of Eid. And they'll talk about the uh, Banarsi fabrics and things he will go to great lengths to get for them to, you know, to procure. Similarly, as we saw, the Rababis were gifted with gold bangles and with you know 200 rupees just for one performance so so in that sense you yeah but there is i haven't found evidence of uh, a courtesan kind of writing something the, i mean the, you have a lot more on his vibes his courtesan vibes because bibi mora um, built a madrasa a mosque she built the in the copper mandi bazaar in lahore she built a mosque which is called my mora masjid and she, but she also gave donations to temples. So there was this kind of, you know, cheek, jaw, cheek, cheek by jaw kind of uh, cosmopolitanism happening. And uh, she was definitely very strongly Muslim all throughout, but also gave, as I said, hundred the Bhairo Mandir as well. So it, it's interesting because obviously this is it's like again there is a sense of nostalgia with which I'm also painting this. 
But there is evidence to show this, that this is how it was happening. Clearly, everyone didn't accept her openly. It was still the first Sikh state, so there was very much this attempt to define yourself as Sikh. But uh, Ranjit Singh, uh, you know, as I said, uh, Bibi Mora had so many monuments. Like she was, she built all these uh, structures which are associated with her name even today. Um, there, it was true of the other political wives as well, but to have that for a sort of courtesan wife from another religion is a big thing. Uh, and similarly, uh, Gul Begum, who was the second courtesan wife, she was also very celebrated. And uh, in fact, uh, she was alive when the British took over and she had one of the highest pensions. That So she had like a, uh, she was on an allowance of 12,500 rupees a year, which is what the British had to kind of pension her off to, you know. Uh, so she she had one of the largest estates and one of her structures, uh, which is in Lahore, is still also uh, standing strong. So I think these are the ways in which perhaps we can see how these courtesans survived and, you know, left their traces, if not through, you know, in the written evidence. But there is, sorry, but there is a, a book by Anshu Malhotra, who is a very important scholar of gender uh, in Punjab, and she's looked at uh, Piro's Kathis. Piro was a, a sort of low-status country or prostitute from, the, from Lahore in Ranjit Singh's time, and she converted to the Gulabdasi sect of Sikhism. So she's written poetry. So that's one of the few examples of a female ekta view, sorry. One, you know, firstly, you don't get uh, female writers and authors in that time. Like this is uh, early 19th century, and when you do to get it from a courtesan is even harder. But the fact that she was literate, as a even as a sort of low status kanjari, she was literate, and she could then write and compose her own kafis and her own poetry uh, when she converted to the Kulabasi uh, Dera. Um, and this was noted even by later British uh, visitors to Punjab that even the sort of low status Kanjari has a certain uh, literacy, uh, which is very interesting to note. So these were because these were women, public women, on account of their sexual services and things like that. But of course, elite courtesans were purveyors of elite literature and poetry and culture as well. But these were the women who were allowed to read and write, which is very interesting. Sorry, Suparna had a question. Thanks, Radha, for that wonderful talk. One thing that uh, we concluded as was that these courtesans or dancing girls or Amazons, uh, they subverted the gender hierarchy. Mm. Uh, I was thinking whether it could be thought otherwise, because this inversion of, uh, you know, uh, of dressing, like where they had to wear, uh, uh, I mean, yeah, yeah. The ma masculine clothes yeah. and, sh you know, showcase martial valor. It, can it be thought that, you know, they had to shed their femininity to endorse this code of masculinity. Mm -hmm. So this inversion might not be a subversion. Oh, very uh, interesting. So uh, how would you interpret that? That's very interesting that it's only by acting as men that these women can uh, proclaim their power in this way. Yeah, and so this is also related to the question of agency, which hmm. someone in the audience presented. So somewhere, uh, I mean, this is a, I mean, a, hmm. a stifling of a female representation, of a hmm. feminine representation hmm. to, uh, you know, if I think of Ranjit Singh, yeah. then perhaps uh, this is something to showcase that Indian rulers as such hmm. were not effeminate, hmm. you know, which otherwise in like in Avad or you know mm. yes how in Asha. Asha. Yeah. yeah so how this uh, you know is a counter to that kind of representation yeah. by the ruler that's really interesting thank you because yes that would make sense then thank you for that interpretation that uh, the fact that he insists on them 
dressing in this masculine way is also a counter to uh, this European discourse of effeminizing, uh, feminizing the Indian rulers. Uh, definitely, and uh, I mean the obvious, the obvious thing is that they are copying the Sikh soldiers on the battlefield. But I think you're right that there is this nuance. And of course, I mean, agency beyond the point, this is a patriarchal world. This is an all-powerful, paternalistic, very masculinist, uh, patriarchal monarch. So there is not, I and mean, you cannot uh, have agency in the same way as uh, one would perhaps think of today. But, uh, you know, in that way, the Prem Sumar quotation of courtesans tempting and, uh, you know, laying, laying, you know, you know, showing, exposing uh, an imposter for who he is. This is the kind of thing Ranjit Singh often did. It was through humor and through kind of tempting one of his European rivals through a courtesan and, you know, playing these sort of games that uh, these women, you know, the typical sort of very limited gender way of showcasing a woman's power through her seduction and through her sexuality. So that also happened. So it's definitely there's these two extremes of uh, uh, feminized beauty and uh, performance and tempting these European uh, uh, officials. And on the other hand, you have this very uh, masculinist uh, avatar. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so it's similar to what I think Suparna uh, said. So I'm thinking about when they were when the Amazons were asked to give up their um, feminine avatar and don these clothes. Is there any record? which states or documents that what were the, their feelings about and given that for example we also know that they took years of apprenticeship and education mm -hmm. to become good in their art and whatever mm -hmm. and they were asked to kind of shed all of that mm -hmm. which became a mockery like mm -hmm. it was a mockery of their art mm -hmm. and they were asked to take up these military and show valor mm -hmm. through their dance is there any documentation basically probably i'm looking at it as a modern woman mm -hmm. how i would feel insulted to shed what I have spent years and years to learn, mm. and then I thought I was celebrated basically for mm. being for dancing, and then I'm just asked to take on this another thing yeah. uh, for the pleasure of the king. Yeah, unfortunately, I've I've not come across anything because this is the official. The records I've seen are only like Sonal Suri was Ranjit Singh's. You know, it was it was out speak like his representative. Like you know, he would say whatever Ranjit, and he was a chronic very like, good record. So it's coming from a very male perspective what he's writing. So you don't see enough of uh, the, you know, what the voices, what the women wanted themselves. But I think I would perhaps rethink uh, how they thought of this masculine dance because we don't know if it was, if, I think there was more to it and it could perhaps, they could perhaps be doing the Kehrva dance and they could perhaps be doing dances which already pre-existed as we saw, it definitely pre-existed whether it's the Gatka. So maybe they thought of it as, uh, it could be both ways. Maybe some thought they have to give up their femininity, but maybe it's the, uh, some other saw it as an opportunity as well uh, to More learn another kind of dance or to ex explore a queer identity. So it's really interesting how that would have worked. Again, you have to imagine, I think I should write a novel. <laughs> it's set of an academic book. And it would be far more fun and it would rival any Game of Thrones uh, in the Western part. Uh, just an answer to Vada. So, about the dancer or Kutani talk that she would she was a poetess or she was yeah. writing. So, is there documented evidence that she would write herself? Because from those times, there's also that these people who were writers were not really literate to say they could not read and write, hmm. but because they had these imaginations yes. uh, of poetic forms, they would, yes. uh, you know, um, read it loud to somebody else who would document it. Yes. No, this this woman definitely wrote because she left her name in okay. like, like, you know, you have Kehat Kabir, Kabir says yeah. or Nagat. So she wrote Piro, she put her name. So it's really very interesting that book on Piro and the good of that piece. Yeah. Uh, thanks so much for a wonderful talk. It was really, really informative. Thanks. I was kind of wondering about like how did colonial perceptions change? Because you showed us a slide in which it said that when they first performed for the British, they thought they were screaming. Mm -hmm. Does that change later on? 
Mm -hmm. And what I was also wondering, what was the broader context that Ranjit Singh like thought that he should introduce them as like a political interface to the British, and I would imagine to like other groups in South Asia as well? Yeah, so I'll answer the second question first. I think the immediate context was to impress Victor Jacquemus, the French scientist. So it was in preparation for his arrival to Lahore that it's, it's the first evidence, the first kind of written documentation of the Amazons that we find, which is 1831. Um, and I think I think Suparna perhaps cracked it when she said that in presenting this very uh, non-effeminate group of women, it was a way of symbolizing the superiority and strength of the Sikh state to these rivals. So even though uh, Jacques Maud is not is not British, um, he is European, and there's a load of like there's like a really long uh, string of Europeans visiting Lahore, uh, and the biggest rivals are the British, of course, the East India Company. So it's a message to the East India Company as well that uh, you know we are not just uh, politically uh, and militarily strong, but even so by putting these displays. Uh, in the, in, when you have negotiations, which is part of, uh, it will, you could dazzle this, as uh, Priya Atwal says, this was uh, Ranjit Singh's kind of a maneuver to dazzle uh, his visitors through by putting on this kind of performance and this show. So that's the larger context in which, and she, uh, Priya Atwal, who's written the book on royals and rebels, she said that this is what Ranjit Singh did with the weddings as well. All these sort of grandsons and all these big weddings, these also became spectacles where European uh, officials would be invited just to show the kind of uh, you know abundance and trust, like the kind of financial strength also of the Sikh Empire. Uh, but so these are the kind of more subtle ways of uh, resisting uh, encroachment on your territory by these people who definitely had their eyes on uh, Punjab, and as we see later on, if they did annex it. Um, and uh, it was also reversing the gaze in a way, because what we hear about mostly, and as I've also described, we hear about Europeans looking at South Asians, and this is their view of South Asians. But how did Ranjit Singh and his courtiers, how did they reverse the gaze and look at the Europeans and evaluate them? And dancing is a very interesting window for that, because uh, there was the, the you know the English women were afraid that when they did partner dancing at these European balls, that if the, what they said, the Sardars, or if the, uh, the people from Ranjit Singh's court came to these balls, they said, I'm afraid that this will be a mistaken, dancing will be mistaken for not change. Mm -hmm. And the fact is that that's exactly what happened, because in the Persian Chronicles, when um, William Benting and his wife sort of opened the, you know, opened the proceeding with the ball and the dance together, the uh, Indians, sort of the Punjabis or whatever, uh, Ranjit Singh and his courtiers reinterpreted this as uh, even uh, William Benting's wife danced for the Maharaja. So, and it, the other English ladies looked like Kuris from heaven or fairies from heaven and they danced for us. Um, and, uh, and, you know, they were also equated in a sense with the dancing girls at uh, Ranjit Singh's court. So it was viewed in a sense of reciprocity that the uh, East India Company is reciprocating because we have shown our dancing girls now these English women are now dancing in response. So that becomes a kind of reversing the gaze and sort of reciprocity uh, and almost like a gifting of performance. Like you, we've gifted you with the performance of our performers and because th those were the terms in which they viewed performance. They could not imagine uh, women of high birth or respectable women, so-called, to perform in public, because that wasn't something that happened in South Asia. Yeah. Sorry, what was the other question? Uh, the, the, the first one was about like how does the political gaze like change? But I think it could be partly answered already. How does it change? Yeah. Yes, I think it's there's there's no one way to answer this because different colonial officials had different ways of evaluating. Mm -hmm. Those who spent more time in India, uh, and you know, those who went, took the effort to learn Indian music, obviously their understanding changed. And one of these people was Anne Wilson, who was a Scot Scotswoman, who learned, who came first to Punjab as the wife of a uh, civil service uh, sort of official. And she, her first reaction was like, oh my god, it sounds like these men have a toothache. 
uh, it's they, they're torturing they have to think they're tortured themselves and they're torturing us by singing but then she learned and she kind of wrote a lot of books explaining the theory of indian music and how it works to to an audience here in in uh, in britain so that's how it changed for some of some of them maybe not all that's it's going to be hard to answer that as you know Sorry, you had a question. Uh, yeah, was there much competition sort of, between other rulers like in the area and South Asia um, with uh, Ranjit, like in terms of like dancing and stuff? Um, was that only something that he did, or like did other rulers start? Like, other rulers also had their own troops of dancing girls and of musicians, um, and I think. Uh, there was talk of Begum Sumru, who was who was one of the first Indian women, not first, but one of the well-known Indian women to convert to Christianity, and she was a ruler as well in what is present-day Haryana. And she, uh, someone tried to loan her musicians to Ranjit Singh as well. So it was again, it was part of political negotiation. So that's the one thing I have come across. But. Uh, uh, the other, so there is evidence of William Benting, who the English uh, sort of governor general, he had his own troop of dancing girls. So that's how important this group was to sort of political um, diplomacy in the 19th century. So, I mean, of course, the Indian rulers everywhere had huge uh, cohorts of dancing girls. Uh, Wajid Ali Shah in Lucknow had a big, very big sort of uh, you know, band of musicians and dancing girls. So this is these courts is where uh, innovation in music and dance would occur. This is where they would be employed and get the most kind of handsome remuneration for their art. But I don't know if I've answered your question. Okay. Yeah. And um, you kind of briefly touched upon the common oasis aspect of how the West is sort of feminized the East. Yeah. Have there been any accounts where they've kind of focus on of Benedict's things called mm -hmm. on the arts and dance have kind of been viewed from that perspective and have been interpreted as more the weakness rather than kind of demonstration of power. Yeah, all the time. That's exactly what the Europeans always that he wastes his time uh, you know listening to and watching dancing girls. And uh, Henry Lawrence, who was part of the team that overtook Punjab and kind of robbed the leap singh and you know vilified his mother Rani Jinda and brought the lip sync to Britain. He wrote a very salacious novel based on his experience. It is, you don't know whether what is truth and what is not, but when you start reading it and you see the stereotypes, you can figure out what's truth and what's fiction. But it's based on his own experience and his own time uh, in as an officer in Punjab. And he gives this really sordid tale of, you know, this is the sex trade and this is the slave trade and this is what Ranjit Singh is doing. So that's the image that these Europeans had. And that is part of this uh, Victorian social morality as well in the way they view. So it's coming from cultural context in England as well, right? So that's how you then view everything is very restrained. Whereas as William Dalrymple's book, White Moogles, has shown that earlier, you know, in the late 18th century, there was a different attitude towards the Orient to the, and to the East. This is something that changed with time. Does that, yeah? yeah? Okay, good. Rana just was very curious to know about, as you said, uh, the relation between the visual evidence yes. and that of uh, Our music. Yeah. So, and the various schools of painting would be the Bahari school of painting and the Jamba school yeah. of painting which uh, concentrates upon you know these representations uh what i was uh, like you know thinking about is there any you know treatise on painting which uh you know in a way takes this as a model because the last painting that you had shown uh you know that yes mm -hmm. this is so very different Yes. It's almost like cubism, you know? Yeah, but, yeah. And so this vernacular art, uh, how how does it kind of relate? So I should clarify that the rest of these images are from like the mid early to mid-19th century, 1840s, 50s. 
but this image is from the late 19th century sorry oops this one is mm -hmm. from the late 19th century mm -hmm. so it's that very much uh, you know it's it's like uh, about 40 50 years since the british are annexed punjab so there is that influence of and this is also the time when a lot of english officers of the raj are uh, commissioning a lot of indian art in punjab especially they get a lot of punjabi artists to make these sketches of the different professions of punjab or even image uh, you know sketches of people at ranjit singh spot because there was a huge fascination with the last sort of king of lahore uh, so this is part of that tradition and in fact it entered the victorian albert museum archives in london uh, it was acquired by a missionary uh, colonel henley who was a missionary in punjab or in, uh, yeah in punjab so the, the connection of how this art ends up in museums and libraries in england is also very fascinating it's part of the history of colonialism um, and uh, but yeah who and the, it's anonymous we don't know who sketched it that's the problem so there's no way of yeah, because this doesn't seem to be very vernacular. No, it's um, not Pahari at all. It's yeah, from it's the Punjab plains, mm -hmm. unlike this image, which is, I think, Kangra painting. Again, mm -hmm. this is at, it's at the Oxford uh, Ashmolean Museum. Uh, but this is, again, late 18th century. And so this is a century apart. So this is late 19th. So yeah, but this, this concept occurs in other forms of Indian painting from much before, like Composite elephant, composite uh, tiger, lion, made up of human figures. This is something that's uh, there in other uh, schools of painting. So the concept comes from the schools of Indian painting, but the execution is certainly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Yeah, I was sort of a big question on like the Murashahi Shahi coin. Um, so what I said is that there's still some debate like whether that was indeed the yeah. order or whether there was yeah. for a tree. Like what's your interpretation of that? Uh, I have unfortunately not gone too much into depth because yeah. it seemed like a Pandora's box. There was so much literature on it. Mm -hmm. um, there is, uh, you know, it could be just a, a peacock. Mm -hmm. It could, and my sense is that it perhaps was issued for Bibi Mora because obviously uh, Ranjit Singh was a master of subtlety mm -hmm. and uh, some of the records show that um, uh, yeah that that you know I mean that, that this the that the British was viewed by Indians as an old woman and uh, there was also an old woman depicted on one of these coins and that was a jibe at the at uh, the East India Company being an old woman and not very capable of ruling, or I don't know, something like that. But uh, yeah, I think it's open to interpretation. I wouldn't, uh, but he was a big sort of master of subtlety, so we wouldn't put it past him. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for everyone signing up. Uh, yeah, great. Like, it's first time for us to have like such an academic talk on yeah. something cultural as well. Usually, we're just doing stupid stuff, basically. But, um, yeah, thank I'm you. Sure that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, we can light us with the stupid stuff. Yeah, we're more interested in that. Yeah. Uh, thank you again, Sarada, for coming down from Manchester, like taking time out of a busy schedule. And uh, yeah, thank you again. Yeah, thank you. Oh, and uh, it's being live streamed on our YouTube channel.